This summer, I had the chance to work at a homeless shelter near my hometown. While there, a gentleman told me, you're not gonna change the world. However, you could change someone's life and that will change their whole world. As a social work major, this was really important to me. It's something I realized I need to be present in the people I'm surrounded by. My hope with this talk is not to change the world, but rather to change someone's life, to change their whole world, to bring awareness and to make someone feel less alone. We're gonna explore the unknown of mental health and mental illness because it impacts more people than you could ever imagine. Yet so little is known about those who suffer, the signs and symptoms, and how to get help. According to the National Alliance on Mental Illness, 19.1% of adults have experienced a mental illness in 2018. If there were 100 people in this room, 20 people would have been battling a mental illness. Additionally, 16.7% of children between the ages of 6 and 17 have experienced a mental illness. Mental health is a crisis this world is facing, but so little is known about it because not all disabilities are visible to the naked eye. In high school, I was a three-sport athlete, I was on the dean's list, I volunteered for over 500 hours between my church and a special needs camp. I was in every club you could think of. I was a good student. Fast forward to college, not much has changed. I made the dean's list every semester here. I'm the vice president of one club, a member of three or four others. I sit on our student senate, and I'm a lead student coordinator for our holiday season assistance program. I'm a busy person, but I'm also an overcommitter. This wasn't something I realized until recently that I do. And it's something that I had to take a step back and reanalyze what was going on in my life. I was burnt out, I couldn't sleep, I didn't, wasn't the same Brittany I used to be. This was something I realized, it's in my peers too. We have to have this pressure of being the best of the best, of doing more and being more. But it's so important to take a step back and to realize you can breathe, you can say no, and it's okay to sit this one out. Despite all of the love, and support I had from my family and friends. My life quickly became something I never imagined. My senior year of high school, two weeks before my 18th birthday, we received the call I was dreading. My biological father had died and he had lost his battle with addiction. It was crazy to think that I had gone from this person who was had it all, do it all, be it all, to this person who didn't want to live anymore. My father's death took away my own desire to live. That was crazy for me to think of going from one person to the next. However, my peers had no clue about my biological father. They also had no clue about the path I was about to take and the steps I was about to take to transform myself from one person to a completely unrecognizable person in the eyes of my peers and my family. I lacked confidence. I had no hope of the future, which is ironic because I'm standing here in front of you at my own college where I never expected myself to be. The smiley, cheerful go-getter I'd once been was gone. The steps to get to the place I am now were difficult, but if it wasn't for those steps, I would not be standing here in front of you today. They literally saved my life. However, I hid my suffering from my peers and most of my family. It was difficult for me because of the stigma of mental illness. According to the National Alliance of Mental Illness, the average onset of symptoms that an adult feels to their time of treatment is 11 years. 11 years someone will never get back. 11 years of feeling hopeless. 11 years of feeling alone. That's a long time. That's almost half of my lifetime. I started therapy and I was, I was diagnosed with depression and anxiety and I had a panic and an adjustment disorder. All of those things became a label. However, I'm not a fan of labels. But these were the ones that I needed to see, to see the help that I needed to go get. I wouldn't get out of bed. I lost 15 pounds because I had stopped eating. I didn't want to go to my sports. I didn't want to go to school. College was completely out of the picture. After a few weeks and a few months in therapy, I realized I needed to get more help. So I went on to an outpatient program for three weeks. I stopped attending school. I stopped going to sports. I stopped seeing my friends. The only people I was surrounded by was my family. In those three weeks, I had intensive outpatient therapy, which considered um, cognitive behavioral therapy, which helped me to retrain my thoughts, more individual therapy, and medication. If it wasn't for those steps, like I said, I would not be here in front of you today. However, the steps to get there and the steps to move forward aren't over. Mental health was not something we talked about often in my family. My parents weren't aware of the signs and the symptoms because no one had told them. It wasn't something that they grew up learning about. 
These signs and symptoms that they didn't know about were present in me from day one, from the moment I received the call that my dad was going to die, that he had six months to live. They had watched their daughter go from this smiley, cheerful go-getter to a person that they no longer recognized. I couldn't look in a mirror and tell you who I was. I felt alone, I was scared, and I didn't know a single person who felt the way I did. When I was at my outpatient program, my family and friends had no clue where I was. And they won't know unless they watch this very video later, because it's still not something I talk about. However, I'm here in front of you today to share my story. Some things need to change. But first, I want to point out these three pictures. These are pictures of me, obviously. However, they were taken during my senior year during three very different parts of my life. The first picture is my senior picture. It was taken right after we found out that my father was on his deathbed. The second picture was taken at a basketball game that I had attended. While I was at my outpatient program, I still went to cheer on my team and see some of my friends. However, I didn't compete. And the third picture was a few months after I got discharged. Now, unless you've been my roommate since freshman year, or you're my parent or my boyfriend, you may not be able to tell the difference in all these pictures. But I'm completely different people in each of these. A completely different person in each of those than I am right now. So I want to share with you some tips and some tricks that you can use to help yourself and those around you. The first step is to have uncomfortable conversations. These are insanely difficult because it requires both people to be vulnerable. But if they don't happen, we'll lose more people. According to the World Health Organization, 300,000 people or 800,000 people die each year of suicide. This, these people die because of the stereotypes behind mental illness. The stereotypes that I was all too aware of. Jocks are supposed to be stuck up, nerds are supposed to stick to themselves, and mental illness is supposed to be dirty, unkept, unorganized, tired. You know what I'm talking about. Mental illness is supposedly visible. All of these stereotypes are wrong, and all of these stereotypes stop people from getting the help that they need. People didn't believe me when I told them I didn't want to live anymore. How could this girl who went from being it all and doing it all not want to be here, not want to continue those things? On top of the 800,000 people that die every single year, there's one every 40 seconds, and it's the second leading cause of death for the people between the ages of 15 and 19, the age that I was suffering the most. These uncomfortable conversations can start easily. You can say, hey, I've been worried about you. Can we talk about what you're experiencing? Or, hey, what's going on? Can we talk about it? Taking that first step shows that you care. You're taking an empathetic approach to talk to somebody. You're not using stereotypes, you're not blaming them, you're not calling them crazy. You're just having a conversation. The next step is to report concerns. If you're a college student in this room, you can talk with your residential life. I promise you, a friend will only be so mad at you if you go and report the risky behavior. I'd rather them be mad at you than you have to show up to their funeral. If you're worried about yourself or someone else in regards to suicide, Call the National Suicide Hotline. They can help you. They can walk you step by step on how to get yourself out of that state. The next thing to do is to learn the signs. This is important not only for me, but for family members, for friends, for professors. Any person who has daily interaction, which is all of you, can use these signs to help spot mental illness. Because it's not visible. And that's really scary. Because most things, if I broke my leg, you'd be able to see it. You'd see that I was hurting. But you can't look at me and see, oh my gosh, she has a mental illness. It's not something that's written across my forehead. I did some research to see what some common signs were for various mental illnesses. The National Alliance on Mental Illness states that excessive worrying, fear, or sadness, changes in diet that lead to um, severe weight loss or weight gain, not sleeping or eating, and isolation from friends and family are some of the first signs that you can point out. However, these signs are just a basis to learn more about mental illness. My anxiety doesn't look like someone else's anxiety. My depression doesn't look like someone else's depression. My signs and triggers are completely different than somebody else's. But if you can learn at least the common ones, you can point them out to people and have that conversation. Learning the signs helps you to have those uncomfortable conversations. The next thing is to stop using degrading language. And the reason this is important is because when you tell someone it's all in their head, that they're crazy, they're overreacting, or even saying the weather is bipolar, is not useful. It does not help people feel more 
surrounded by love and care. It makes people feel more isolated and like they aren't normal. And maybe they're not normal, but who is? This degrading language can stop people from getting help. It feeds into the stereotypes that we are all familiar with. Additionally, when we stop using degrading language, it also includes not saying you're depressed, you're anxious, or you suffer from a mental illness when you haven't been diagnosed. The reason for this is because mental illness isn't a personality trait. It's not something I can put on in the morning and take off at night. It literally inhibits my daily actions. So it's important to find these signs, to use the language that's proper, and to help your loved ones out. The next thing to do is to end the stigma. You can do this by having conversations with your doctor, your therapist, your, your roommates, your friends. You can have these conversations around the dinner table. Mental illness should be something we talk about all the time. When I came to college, I had the choice. I didn't have to tell my friends and my loved ones about my mental health battle. I didn't have to tell them that my dad had died. But I wanted to. I wanted them to know that they weren't alone in their own mental health battle. I want them to know that mental health has no face, no style, no look. It doesn't look one way versus another. It's completely different for each person it inhibits. And then the stigma means correcting people when they use the degrading language. It means starting these conversations as early as you can. Even if you mess up, at least you tried. When you do these steps, you might save someone's life. And that is extremely important in today's world. So we can make that onset of symptoms in time of treatment less than 11 years. So we can lower that 800,000 people that die every single year from suicide. I'm happy to say that with the help of therapy, with medication and the support from my family and friends, I learned the tools to take myself out of a hard time. However, it's never over and it's still something I battle with every single day. But teaching my loved ones my signs and triggers help me, help them to help me. It helped them to point out my triggers, to say, hey, Brittany, that's not healthy, or hey, you need to take a break. Hey, you need to do this and you need to do that, because I don't notice it in myself. Like I said, I'm an overcommitter. It's something I do all the time, and it's not always something that I recognize. Mental health, like I said, has no face, no style, and no look, because mental health can look like a girl just like me. Thank you.